All right, I'm happy to introduce Jamie Wilkinson uh, from uh, a Site Reliability Engineer from Google Australia uh, on better living through statistics and how monitoring does not have to suck. Morning, PuppetConf. Uh, my name's Jamie. I'm a Site Reliability Engineer at Google uh, in Sydney office. Um, these are my email addresses, so pick one. I prefer the, the private one, Space Pants or Dog. If, uh, if you're willing to uh, talk to me about this afterwards, um, at Jack Pants. I didn't write that up there, but that's my Twitter if you'd like to send me some stuff. Anyway, so um, uh, I haven't really done any monitoring in the open source world for, well, six years now because I've been inside the black hole. Uh, and so I have a lot of opinions about it, and I really enjoy it. And so I've been following this uh, monitoring sucks hashtag with a bit of interest, because I'm really excited to see what the rest of the world is doing with it. But uh, it makes me kind of sad to see people saying that monitoring sucks, because I think monitoring is actually pretty cool. Um, so I was thinking, what could I talk about? And uh, Nigel invited me to come speak at Puppet Camp in Sydney about six months ago. And so I was like, uh, am I really going to provide something relevant. These people seem to really know what they're talking about. Uh, and I was validated when I read this blog post, which said, you know, instead of alerting on data and then storing it as, as an afterthought, uh, perhaps we should actually start alerting based on the time series itself. And uh, I found that really uh, comforting because that's really what I want to talk about. Um, so what is monitoring? I'm sure you're all uh, well versed in, in what's actually going on. But right now, I think there are four main components there is uh, obviously measuring it, uh, recording the results of those measurements, alerting based on the measurements, and visualizing what's being recorded. Now, monitoring systems obviously automate a lot of those boring parts so we can get on and do useful stuff. Otherwise, you know, it would be a terrible job if you had to go and measure for everything manually and decide whether there was something to take action on. Um, but as I see it right now in the open source world, there's uh, two uh, main features of monitoring. Black box monitoring, which is uh, to treat the, uh, the system is a black box and probe it as a user would, uh, and that results in alerts. And there's white box monitoring, which is to uh, look at the internal state of the system, and um, that goes, gets written to time series databases and turns into charts. Uh, so here we have, um, uh, let's say, a diagram of, of how black box alerting kind of works. There's a, a big Nagios guy firing off thousands of check scripts, each of them testing a bunch of targets. Uh, and then the uh, check script itself gets to decide whether or not it's going to send an alert. Uh, and now I'm really happy to say that there are things like Graphite and StatsD and CollectD and other time series databases that people are writing their application stats to, and I think that's really encouraging. Uh, Nigeos is also now, well, has been for a while, but has the ability to write its perf data as an afterthought to the, uh, to the time series database. So as, as I just said, um, Black box probing is kind of like a, uh, the fuel indicator light. It tells you about the internal state of the system as a, um, sorry, it tells you uh, what the system would look like to a user. The uh, white box, on the other hand, is obviously the metrics. Uh, in real world situations, things like the uh, dashboard of your car is a lot of white box instrumentation, and the electricity and water meters in your home. Uh, so anyway, let's get to the, uh, the core of it. What's wrong with the black box testing alone? Uh, well, it's only a Boolean state. Well, Nagios is kind of a, a, a trinary state. You get to know uh, that something is wrong, but not really a lot of detail about why. Uh, and you don't really have any predictive capacity. You don't really get to say, well, how long is it going to be until we run out of disks? Uh, how do we do our capacity planning? So all the stuff that you can do with historical data is not really readily available to you as a, as a check script. Uh, and now I know you can uh, actually get your Nagios check scripts to look at your time series database and go, well, I've done a little bit of calculation based on the last couple of points, but it returns a true or false. Uh, the check script itself is one of making the decision. So the fuel indicator light is more of a pseudo white box. It gets to look at how much fuel is in the um, gas tank and then say, well, uh, you're, you're probably close to empty. So uh, you don't really get to see, you don't know how long it is until you have to drive to uh, the gas station to fill up. Now, I, I, I guess I use the trip meter to help me decide how long I've tra uh, traveled. Um, but again, that's like 
the, the trip meter tells me about how far the car is driven, which is internal state rather than just uh, whether or not I'm about to run out of fuel. Um, so anyway, we have this thing now, uh, a check script that, a pseudo white box script that inspects the state of the uh, time series database and says, yes, we think their application is, is about to fail, but um, we don't know how long until it does fail. We don't know the quality of the system right now. Um, so these are the problems I, I think that are there with the uh, check alert model. Um, because every check gets to decide for itself whether or not it's, um, it's in a failure situation, uh, tuning becomes very difficult because you now have hundreds or not if not thousands of check scripts, each of them with their own set of thresholds. And if you want to uh, tune that on a global scale, you're either monitoring, uh, you're either tuning every single uh, alert, uh, every single check script individually, or you're doing them en masse and potentially losing a bit of um, uh, precision. The, uh, the cost of adding new targets can be quite expensive when you have to run a separate script with its own individual configuration. And so um, the TLDR version is that the, uh, the cost of maintenance on monitoring systems is quite high, and I believe that's the reason why monitoring sucks. It's not that monitoring itself is bad, it's just that the tools don't allow us to scale very well with the uh, size of the system that we're trying to monitor. The, uh, the quality of the alerts we get out from a system like that is pretty low, so uh, we'd like to improve the quality of those alerts, but doing so in a uh, reasonable way takes a lot of effort. Uh, of course, physical resource limits of running a single check script for every instance of every check uh, has its um, uh, limits. So there you go. Well, the cost of maintenance is too high to improve the quality of alerts. So when we go back to this quote I read, and uh, I think the, the key point here is uh, looking at the time series data that's being collected and start to use that as an alerting source. So let's propose a new system which collects data from time series database. It doesn't apply any rules in the collection phase. It just collects data straight, it stores it in the time series database, and then it analyzes the recent collection and to decide whether or not there are alerts that need to be triggered. Now these rules can uh, apply to everything that's being collected at once. So you no longer have this one-to-one -one mapping of checks to targets or uh, instance of check scripts. You get to apply these rules across the entire service at once. Um, now it is kind of what I said here earlier, but uh, if you remember, the, uh, I said this is a pseudo white box. Each script still has to uh, manually decide whether or not it's, sorry, not manually, it, it has its own authority to decide whether or not there's an, a failure condition. Uh, and I want to uh, extract that ability to make that decision out of the, the thing that is collecting the data and uh, put it into a more centralized location where we can uh, be more adept at, at configuring. Um, so I, I think what you're really asking for is some examples. Maybe I can talk about what, what we can actually do with some time series to help you understand how we can turn that into alerting rules. Um, so if you imagine that a time series is a vector, uh, if we look on this, uh, the first column here, it's, um, there's, there's obviously a head, the most recent result, going back in time at uh, sampling intervals, back to infinity. We call a single time series, say, errors, which is um, obviously the, uh, in this case, we're doing very well. We have no errors across all of our hosts, but each column represents a different instance of this particular variable. Glom them all together, end up with a matrix. So when we want to say, we want to apply some math to the time series, we can say apply it to all of the, the heads of all the time series with the same name across all the different instances that we're collecting. Okay, so uh, I want to give you some real world examples that we can uh, start to build some alerts around. Hi Homer, I'm worried about the beer supply. After this case and the other case, there's only one case left. Yeah, yeah, our Barney's right. Yeah, let's drink some more beer. Yeah, hey, what about some beer? Yeah, Barney's right. All right, guys, pipe. Okay, so uh, Barney obviously cares a lot if the beer supply gets too low, so uh, we could uh, describe an alerting rule where Barney, well, we've collected all the numbers of cases of beer left in the house across all houses, and if that number falls below three, then, or becomes three, then uh, Barney starts to get worried. Now, uh, obviously this kind of alert is uh, 
it's, it's kind of what you're expecting. It's, it's what you can use with Nigel. You don't really have to go and build time series databases because each of these check scripts can just go, well, there's a number of cases left be, uh, three, in which case, fire an alert. Um, it's also not very powerful because it doesn't really apply very well to uh, alerts based on thresholds that may be dynamic. And uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, running out of disk space. And a lot of you who've grown up over the last couple of years and, and had disks uh, double and triple in size in the matter of weeks is uh, frustrating when you set these alerts for, let's say, 90% of, uh, of your disk space. But you start to realize that the amount of free space at 90% on a modern drive is actually quite a lot of, of disk. Do you really want to be woken up in the middle of the night for you only have 10% of your disk? Um, probably not. But on the other hand, you don't really want to set an absolute value either because the, the workload of a particular system, 500 megabytes, might be enough to sustain yourself overnight. It might not be. Uh, it, so what would actually be more useful is to figure out how long it is going to be until the disk fills up based on the current trends and alert based on how long it's going to take a human to fix that problem. So, well, jumping the gun a bit there. Let's uh, look at another real world example. I can find you. Pop quiz, hot shot. There's a bomb on a bus. Once the bus goes 50 miles an hour, the bomb is armed. If it drops below 50, it blows up. What do you do? What do you do? OK, so Dennis Hopper <laughs> wants to know when the bomb, uh, sorry, when the bus is going faster than 50 miles an hour, because that's when the bomb becomes armed. And then if the bus slows down below 50 miles an hour after the bomb has been armed, then, uh, well, you know the rest of the story. Keanu, on the other hand, just wants to know that the bus has gone 50 miles an hour. But is that really all he, well, is that, is that the best way he can be handling this alert? Um, I think I've forgotten a slide. Yeah, never mind. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't Keanu be more interested in uh, knowing at the point in which time is critical, at which point the bus starts slowing back down towards 50 miles an hour, at, at which point it's becoming dangerously close to, to exploding? Uh, so if we take the uh, derivative of the velocity of the bus, uh, if you remember your high school calculus, uh, you know that when acceleration hits zero, velocity is not increasing anymore. When velo acceleration goes below zero, uh, velocity is decreasing. So we have this danger zone when acceleration hits zero and below, which is when Keanu should stop ca start caring about uh, actually saving the bus. Obviously, he cares about saving the bus beforehand, but when he knows that he has a real deadline, is uh, at the inflection point. So if we apply some maths, we can figure out what Keanu's alert should look like. Uh, now, if the velocity minus 50 over the acceleration is less than the time to save the bus, then he's uh, probably got just enough time to actually save the bus. Let's say less than n equal to. So he has, saves it in the nick of time. So uh, here's a new tool at our disposal, calculus. Um, as you remember from high school, the uh, derivative of speed is acceleration, and the derivative of acceleration is jerk uh, or impulse. The, uh, I find that the, this, is it the second derivative? Let's say just the derivative of the derivative of a rate is actually quite useful because um, it's a lot easier to, to detect a threshold change on that because often the acceleration fluctuates throughout the day too. But the derivative of that is uh, quite a useful indicator of, of uh, actual change. So anyway, um, let's, let's say this is a count of errors over day. And you can see that there's a point in which the uh, rate of errors increases sharply. And now, this is just a counter, so it's obviously going to continue incrementing over time. But you can see at the point where there's obviously something interesting going on. If you take the rate of change of the errors, it's very easy for you to go, there's a threshold that's um, alert based on the, uh, assume you have a, a baseline number of errors. And I'm sure you all you know that your systems aren't perfect. There's always going to be a, a base error rate. So you don't want to be paging every time there's an error because they're always happening. But you do want to know that there's a baseline of errors. If we uh, start going abnormally high than the uh, baseline of errors, then we can page on that event. Uh, so first tip for dealing with time series is to calculate the rate of change of counters and use that for, uh, 
for um, calculating whether or not to send an alert. Um, another tool, and we kind of uh, alluded to this earlier with um, Dennis Hopper's alert. It, it's not really, you don't want to, you don't have the ability to just look at the last um, value of the time series. You can look at the, uh, most, the recent history. You can look at uh, distant history. So why, why do you have to limit yourself to, um, to just checking the most recent value when you can take uh, the rate of change over time? Um, as an aside, I find two and a half times the sampling interval a useful metric for um, uh, a, a minimum for doing a, a historical analysis because at that point you get at least two uh, sampling points. Uh, so here we are, it is a traffic spike. It's going over a threshold. Uh, is the instance of the, uh, the first spike worth getting you out of bed for? Uh, I would say no, um, because it has recovered very quickly and by the time you're awake and logging in, the uh, problem has resolved itself. The, uh, the second instance, yeah, maybe. It, it depends on uh, how much of a, a buff you are and what time of day it is, but uh, the, the longer that an error rate is sustained for, the more interesting it's going to be. Uh, if the curve doesn't swing back down at the end of it and keeps swinging up, then obviously that's something you are really interested in and uh, should start investigating. So the second tip for dealing with time series is don't just deal with the head of the time series, deal with the, uh, the whole, um, well, as much as you care about. So uh, I've, I've talked about counters. Time series do have types. Counters are monotonically increasing. They always go up. They don't have to always go up. They can be flat, but they can't go down. Gauges, on the other hand, and I'm sure this is familiar to anyone who's dealt with SNMP types, gauges can go up and down. Um, a counter merely counts events. A gauge could be like your current velocity. So speed, obviously, is changing over time. But the number of kilometers, sorry, miles that you've been driving is uh, uh, always going to be increasing. So counters are cool because it doesn't matter how often you sample, that you're always going to get the, uh, a reasonable estimate of what the counter has been doing uh, in between uh, sampling intervals. So uh, we haven't really lost any meaning at this point. But gauges, on the other hand, you don't really know if there's been a uh, massive change in the value between sampling intervals. Now, if you looked at that, would you know really what has gone on? It would just look like the, uh, the same original counter. So uh, my third tip to you is dealing with time series is prefer to do everything as a counter type rather than a gauge. Just because it gives you a lot more power. You can always calculate a gauge based on a counter by turning it into a rate. Um, oh yeah, so aggregation. Uh, instances often work in clusters, especially nowadays with the cloud. Uh, Summing time series together is obviously a very easy way to figure out how the total performance of a cluster is, is behaving relative to the rest of it. Um, it's very easy to find outliers in your system by taking the average performance of all of the uh, machines in a cluster and then comparing individuals to see whether or not uh, they're performing within reasonable parameters. Uh, so here's an example, just two uh, things. Perhaps there's a, um, a traffic slop for some reason one uh, back end starts getting more traffic than the other one. But obviously, the overall capacity of the system has uh, remained the same. Um, so the rate of, you, get, you sum the individual counters and you can take the rate of that. It's a very simple uh, way of, of dealing aggregation. So aggregate to each level logical grouping. If you have multiple availability zones, then you want to, uh, I think you want to, um, aggregate all the instances within that zone to get the, uh, what the data center is, uh, is doing at that point in time. But you also care about the global performance. So if you have multiple availability zones, then uh, aggregating from the data center level to the global level, again, gives you uh, a nice way, something for, to put on a dashboard, something to say, we know that we're globally over capacity, or uh, you know, preferably within um, normal operating bounds. So let's just recap all the high school maths. And I'm really sorry about this. Uh, derivative of a counter turns into a gauge. A derivative of a gauge remains a gauge. 
Uh, sampling errors can come to bite you when you're uh, taking the rates of things. The, uh, the sum of a counter remains a counter, and the sum of a gauge remains a gauge. The, uh, I didn't cover ratios before. Ratios are pretty cool. It's uh, if you want to take the rate of change of errors and compare that to the rate of change of your requests to know whether or not you're serving more errors than usual. Uh, has, have you deployed a new system and it's starting to uh, fail more often than the previous version? Uh, okay, so what, what should we measure? Uh, I don't really have a definitive list of what to measure, and I think that's really uh, specific to the system, but I know generally that things that are good to measure is how many queries are you doing per second? And that, of course, asks the question, what is a query? Depending on your system, maybe you're just serving uh, small web pages. Maybe your system serves large chunks of data of varying size. Um, maybe there are different types of queries that your system can respond to. And obviously, then you need to break down each of those by the type of query and the responses and come up with a, a large matrix of how many requests of a particular type were served with a particular response code. Uh, errors per second is much easier because you know errors are really, it, well, there was an error or there wasn't an error. But obviously, you can break it down by the type of query that you were sending. Uh, latency is very important. And I would say latency is probably the only thing. If you're going to do one measurement, then measure latency. Uh, again, break it down by payload size and uh, query type. Uh, and if you do care, if you're a, a service that's shipping lots of bytes around, then bandwidth is, and throughput is something that you do want to measure. Uh, there's no point measuring load average. It, it's, you can get much more signal out of other parts of your system. That's not to say load average is a useless thing. It's very useful for debugging, but I don't think it's something you need to really put in a, a dashboard or alert on. Uh, so uh, alerting, um, once we've got these measurements, uh, well, I guess you can just read the slide, but the, um, I guess really what I wanted to cover was make sure that the thing that you're going to letting is something that people can actually respond to, because otherwise, what's the point? Um, but also, you know, alerts should not be logs. You can, you can fire off a log event to say there was a, a failure condition, but nobody could do anything about it. And obviously, that's something you can um, investigate the next day or um, the next week as appropriate. But uh, if you are going to fire an alert, make sure that somebody can do something about it and tell them what they can do. Um, this is kind of a tangent rant, but you know, if you're going to write an alert and you're in a team of more than two people, then you don't want to be waking up when somebody asks his page and goes, well, I don't really know what you're talking about here. Um, and especially you yourself will thank you in the past because I don't know, but I have terrible memory. And so any alert I write, if I haven't written myself a hint about what it means, uh, I've got no chance. Um, despite all this, I think black box testing still has a place, so I don't want to replace Nagios. I, I, I really want to complement it. I want to take away the primary alerting role from Nagios, though, um, because black box tests are end-to-end -end tests. And there's no, no matter how much time series-based alerting you write, you're focusing on a specific internal part of a system, and you can't catch everything. It's, it's very easy to write yourself. Uh, well, it's very difficult to write comprehensive monitoring with time series based alerting, but it's very easy to write something you are confident catches every case, and then you roll out in your system and discover that you forgot to uh, test. Well, let's say somebody writes a new back end and rolls that out, and you weren't aware of that. It's very easy for the, the front end test to pick up the fact that you're now serving errors, but if you weren't aware and didn't write any new monitoring for it, then um, obviously that would be missed. The uh, CEO calls you up and goes, Why is the website down? Um, and at the end of the day, as long as you're still actually collecting all the metrics, you may not have written the alerts. You can, you can get the front end, sorry, the, uh, the black box end-to-end -end test alert, and then go back and look at the charts and do the debugging, do the postmortem, add it to uh, the monitoring in the future. Uh, so anyway, in summary, uh, do maths on your time series, and then blah, blah, blah. Uh, the first time I gave this talk, I just said, all right, now I'll go off and uh, use your favorite statistical package and uh, solve this problem for yourselves. But this time, I actually want to um, give you a, a small demo. Now, how am I going to make this work? Um, so what I did is I wrote 
a, uh, a small, is that readable by everyone? Yes, no? More or less, roughly? Oh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what's going on. Um, this is a very simple web server. All it does is respond to hi, as you can see down on this line, and it returns hi. Uh, it does some useful things, though. It, it, um, it counts the number of requests it's received and the number of errors it served, and records how long it took to do each operation and the uh, number of times an operation took a certain amount of time. So the latency bucketing is uh, done he down here. We're just breaking it up into pounds of two milliseconds. Uh, this, this server does a backend lookup by um, sleeping for a random amount of time and then failing about 5% of the time. Now I have a load balancer as well, and all it does is respond to a high request, picks a random backend um, here, and then does an HTTP get. It's really, really crappy, and I kind of wanted it to be crappy so I could force it to fail. Uh, if it returns to 200, everything went well, otherwise do badness. And uh, the interesting thing, I think, is I've got a collector now. So Go has this, um, let me show you at the top here, this uh, XPVAR module. So it's writing a, a JSON um, uh, endpoint, HTTP endpoint, that contains the uh, values of these variables at any point in time. So uh, I can hit slash debug slash vars on a Go web server with XPVAR installed and get back uh, the value. So the, the collector script is, um, I've given a list of backends and it's actually a little bit complicated, but uh, it goes and tries to, for, for every, um, every interval, which is about one second for this one, it goes to fetch the JSON page for each of the targets and then converts that into CSV and dumps it into a file. Now I really wanted to try and actually use the time series database in between, but I couldn't install Graphite, and I'm looking forward to the talk later this conference to uh, make Graphite installs easy. And I then started using CollectD because that was at least easy to install, but that was a, a rush into madness trying to get, the, uh, to get CollectD to flush the data out faster than it wanted to. Because I'm like, I'm trying to do a demo here. I want it to be fast. Uh, so anyway, I, I know that the latency one is bucketed into um, uh, powers of two. Requests and errors are just uh, ints, so dump them out. Uh, nothing much interesting here. I'm just I'm just having a, a Go channel that um, takes in line records from the fetcher and then dumps them straight out to the CSV uh, relevant to that. So I, I've broken it down by host and variable into uh, my CSVs. Um, what next? So servers, just starts them up. I run 10 backends on port 8,000 upwards. Uh, the load balancer runs on port 9,001. And then the collector just runs with all the uh, backend targets and then runs and waits. And then I've got an antagonizer here using Apache Bench, sending uh, 10,000 connections with a concurrency of 100 to the high server. And then sleeping for a, a bit. So I'm trying to... Uh, this is this complicated bit of bash here. I'm trying to build a um, cascading, right, like uh, the amount of time sleeping between reduces to a, a central point and then increases again. So I'm, I'm trying to build like a, a triangle shaped amount of load. So let's run it. This will take a couple of minutes. So I'll go off and uh, talk about something else. Uh, Sorry, obviously I'm not very good at driving my laptop. Okay, so I chose to use R, and uh, in hindsight that was a bad decision. But uh, I had a colleague who knows how to use it and he warned me against it. Um, so I thought it would be simple for me to write a server that um, would uh, read in data from a socket and then just add it to a, a particular time series and then 
you know, in a loop, go perform some analysis, fire up an email. So I got this far, and all this is doing is reading in data from a socket and printing it out, and that's as far as I got because Go is, uh, not Go, sorry, R is a very complicated language. The help is uh, not much. Anyway, I don't want to rag on R too much. I found it really useful for experimenting with, but actually writing a process is not really production ready. And so I kind of, I'm kind of sad that I wasn't able to give you something that actually implements what I was describing during the talk, but I got really close. And if I was going to do this again, and I had more, like, this is just you know, half a day trying to hack up a prototype to prove to you guys that what I'm talking about is actually feasible. Um, if I was going to do it again, I'd use something like NumPy to do actual, um, to do the time series evaluation. Uh, so where are we? Oh yeah, so you can see the load balance is really crappy. It's timing out. So here we are. Ah, uh, I have a little function to convert timestamps into internal things. I have a little function to read. Zoo is a little time series library in R. So I've got I've got CSV files. Um, uh, broken down by the port number and the uh, variable name. So I can read in this file, and currently that's what it looks like for requests on the first back end. I've got to remind myself what I was going to talk about. Oh, yeah, so errors and requests. Um, okay, so let's load load balancer errors into a variable called EZ. You can see that. And then request into RZ. Sorry, Z. Um, now, we plot the errors, and that's on this screen. So there you go. Errors increasing. Um, what's more interesting, though, is so I can take the uh, differential, and that's the, basically the rate calculation. So this is something I'd be applying to the head every time, taking the difference between uh, now and the most recent value. But we can take the rate of the ratio rate of errors over requests, get a big table. And so they see that where the error rate has spiked quite a lot in the, I don't know, what, two minutes ago? So we can alert on that. So we'll put that in a variable called ER. And then we can say ER where ER is greater than 0.2. We get some values. So now, if that, then alert. Oh, I better load that library up. So I have this function alert, which sends me an email. So if what did I want to alert with? Oh yeah, error eight. Hi. And then stick in the contents of the result. It's crust. Now, go to my convenient demo page here. Boom. New message from our mail. Oh, look. I've got an error. So, hurrah. I managed to successfully send me an alert. Applause. Thank you for indulging me. Uh, okay, so, and then quickly, just another demo. Uh, I want to plot the latency. So, I'll just copy and paste that. Uh, so, what I've done is load the latency metrics into LMZ, the latency by millisecond, and So 
So I'm plotting that. So you can see here uh, a breakdown of latency by um, um, lower bound power of two. So you can see the latency is getting pretty bad at this point where um, well, there's quite a, a high number of seconds spent. So this is the top metric, the, uh, sorry, the y-axis is total number of seconds spent in that bucket. And then the uh, lines represent a different bucket. So the, uh, I think it's the 512 millisecond or the 1024 millisecond bucket is spent a lot of time waiting. And that's just uh, taking the derivative of the latency matrix. Now the other one I've got here is, uh, I now want to look at the, if you look down there, so I'm taking the one to nine values, which is uh, everything up to, um, from the first column to the ninth column, which is two to the 20, two to the nine, um, 256, 512. So it's everything below 512 over the total sum of that row. Are you following this? So um, just summing the first half of, well, not really half, first bunch of values over the total amount of time spent, and then taking that over that, and now we get the uh, percent of, um, uh, sorry, the percent of requests that have been below, let's say, 512 milliseconds. So I think, no, I'm confusing myself. Anyway, over 256 is the one where um, the last couple of columns, so we're actually looking at the, all the ones that are taking the most time and seeing how much of the time we are spending on that. So plot over 256. You can see that uh, there's actually a lot of time spent in longer than 512 millisecond requests. Uh, 0.8, so 80% of requests is somewhere around the middle band there. So obviously there's something you're gonna load on as well, using the same thing as just go, um, if, well, I'll just go over 256 greater than 0.1, there's a whole lot of trues there, so that's pretty bad. Uh, okay, so. Let's get back to this guy. Uh, does that make sense to everyone? Um, okay, so that's the demo. Uh, do we have any questions? I think we've got like five minutes left. Yes? Uh, if you just want to call them out, I'll repeat them for the uh, benefit of the tape. So R is cryptic, and this is uh, really obtuse. Yeah. R, 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 R is hard, and, and this is really cryptic. So is there anything actually off, off the shelf that we can use to, um, to do this? Uh, no. Part of the, the uh, reasoning for me doing this talk is because I want somebody out here to be inspired and kind of <laughs> build that tool. Like, so I have a tool, but I'm not allowed to kind of talk about it because it's kind of, you know, like, it's proprietary, yeah. So. Like, I, I, I want to kind of give you the gist of it and go, here's, um, here's some ideas. Like, if someone can do it better than uh, trying to read uh, CSVs out of R, then that would be totally awesome. And I, like, I think Graphite is kind of half of the way there because it does do a lot of these operations, but visually. Like, if they can separate the visual from the operations and, and maybe have a rule language, I think that would be totally awesome. CEP mon, Mozilla use it. So apparently that's um, awesome. So I'm really pleased to hear that. How do I get confidence in the uh, metrics received given that the database itself might not be reliable? Um, that's a good question. That's for uh, advanced, better living through statistics 202. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, if, you, if your system is good at dealing with NANs, like if you're writing, we tried to do a measurement, but there was no value versus uh, there wasn't a measurement at all, uh, I think you can do some smart stuff there. And obviously, you want a monitoring, monitoring system too. And if there are bad WAN links, then hopefully you can ignore um, measurements higher up in the stack and go, well, obviously, our problem is. Like, we're firing alerts all over the place, but we know that the network is the issue right now. So, yeah, I don't know. It, it kind of comes out in the wash. That's not really a good answer. Yeah. Was there uh, another one? Oh, I've got to wrap up. So uh, if you want to talk more about this, come see me afterwards. Um, it was a real pleasure to come and speak in front of you all today. So uh, thank you, and 
Have a good day.